All right, welcome back to week number two for the Battalion Chief Development Program. And uh, today be uh, a little bit shorter video than last week, and they'll kind of alternate like that through the six weeks. And it'll allow us to uh, not have so much week to week, but I hope you're enjoying it so far. Be sure to let me know if you have any questions or problems. This week, we're going to talk about making the transition from floor to desk, and it's going to be a unique situation uh, for each of us, depending on where we work, how large our organization is, what type of organization that we have, uh, whether we're paid, combination, or volunteer. A lot of things are going to play uh, into how we make that transition, and some of these things uh, will apply differently for, for each of you. So take what works and use it. Um, adapt to your own situation. And uh, during the discussion, be sure and add your own experiences and uh, challenges, or things that have worked for you or things that uh, you're trying to overcome uh, so everybody can learn something from each other, which is the point of the discussion forum. So first, you need to know uh, the expectations of you. And unfortunately, not every organization has leadership that provides specific outlined expectations when they are promoting up or even just in general. Not everybody communicates these things, um, but it's incumbent upon you to, to know what those are ahead of time. And you need to know job description, which we'll talk about. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about new perspectives and, and some challenges with how we look at things compared to how we did on the floor. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit labor to staff. Not all of you uh, may be dealing with this, or you may still be in the in the bargaining unit, even as a battalion chief, but we'll discuss uh, shortly some, some things with that. Um, don't take it personally, which... Um, kind of speaks for itself, but I'll give you a couple examples of, of how, to, how to work with that. And then establishing boundaries and expectations as a battalion chief. And we'll talk about expectations again in another chapter besides today. So some challenges. Um, we've always got the buddy, the boss problem, and especially in smaller organizations where you're close to people, you work with uh, just about everybody in the department at some point between trade time, overtime. Uh, you know, my department's not that large. We're 62 members, uh, fully paid, three houses. So you know everybody and, and you've worked with everybody uh, at some point or another. And it can be very difficult to deal with and handle uh, the challenges that come with having to supervise a friend. And um, those are some challenges that, that we'll, we'll discuss. But the big thing for that is you've, to keep your credibility, you've got to maintain a level of professionalism and consistency with who you're dealing with, uh, no matter who it is. Uh, it can be the person you like least in the department and your best friend, and you've got to treat them the same, um, or fairly. You have to treat them fairly, I should say. But if you let things go uh, because it's a friend or it's a um, – a like-minded person as yourself, your credibility is going to take a hit and you've got to meet those challenges head on. Labor to staff um, or union to staff is a, is a challenge that we all um, are going to deal with. A lot of us are going to deal with in the, mostly the paid departments. There are some combination departments around me that are union and I'm not anti-union, but there are some challenges that come with going from being in the union shop to not being in it anymore. And as a guy who spent five or six years as a shift rep, negotiated three contracts and um, went to bat for, you know, members, when you get out of that bargaining unit like I am now, it's real easy for people to say, oh, you forgot where you came from and you're not the same guy you used to be. Um, all of the things that you might suspect uh, that they would say they say, um, you know, and, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how, how we're going to deal with that. The main thing is an open line of communication. And this happened to me not too long ago on my shift, as a matter of fact, uh, where we had a problem uh, with a member who was from another shift coming to my shift causing problems. And, and he was real quick to point out what he thinks I would have done 10 years ago. Um, and, and, 
in some respects, he may be right. In some respects, he might not be right. But what I like to tell him is that, you know, I did a lot of things in high school that I wouldn't do today. Uh, it doesn't make me a hypocrite. It means that you've matured, you've grown, you've changed. And as a battalion chief, your perspective has to change. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The buck stops here. And this is something I've seen new officers uh, struggle with, um, where uh, it's, it's a bad habit to get into to take everything up the line uh, when you're a battalion chief past you. There are some things that have to go. And that should be established in those expectations and job description. But for the most part, the problems should stop at your desk. That's what you're there for. You're you're running a shift. You're running a comp, uh, you know a uh, a battalion, and it it should stop where you are. It shouldn't move any further along. And um, it, there's risk that isn't that comes along with that. There are. Um, uncomfortableness and challenges and people are going to be mad and upset and they're going to call you names behind your back and they're not going to want to talk to you or be friends with you anymore or whatever it might be. Those, those realities are there and it's going to happen, but you've got to be where the problems stop. Um, for me personally, this was a big problem, uh, making that transition because I was a very hands-on captain. Um, I liked, the tasks and engagement with the crew of doing um, things, whether it be cleaning and, and inspecting tools, training and drilling, which we did on a continuous basis when I was a captain. I liked pulling hose. I liked throwing ladders. I liked getting out and looking at buildings, um, greasing the ladder truck and, and power washing. Or you know, I mean, I liked the hands-on aspects of being a captain and, and being real intimate with crew members and developing them and, and establishing attitudes and, and things in them. And since the, since you, the promotion that changes because there's a fine line between being involved and engaged with your captains and the crew and micromanaging or stepping over the authority that you hand down to those captains to run the crew the way that they want it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in perspective, but it's something that you've got to expect and uh, you have to balance that. And it doesn't mean you're hands off, but you have to be careful with that dynamic with between that relationship between you and the captain's crew and yourself. <clears throat> and finally, the desk. And this is the part that um, I, I struggle with this too, sitting behind a desk. My job's very administrative uh, because we don't have that hierarchy that we talked about in the last, in the last module last week that we don't have uh, those divisions. So I find myself working on scheduling budgets, POs, invoices, overtime, vacation time, uh, fielding PR event requests, um, seat, belt, seat car, car seat installation requests, um, all those things um, I find myself doing and ordering supplies and a lot of the different things that um, typically, you can delegate down, and we do delegate a lot, but um, a lot of the stuff, I get stuck behind that desk, and that can be a challenge for a lot of guys. So I, I've told my members that, you know, if I show up on a call that you, that I normally wouldn't show up on, it's not because I'm micromanaging or even checking you out. It's just I'm bored out of my skull. I need to get out and stay relevant and, uh, and get out in the field. And then your influence, and your influence is critical, and I talk about this in every leadership and, and officer development class that I have, and I normally have it in a different place, but I thought it was important when we talk about the challenges, because your influence is going to change, but it's still got to be prominent. It still has to be um, important to the, the crew and the relationship that you have with the captains and the crew, because if you're not influencing your captains, somebody's going to be and when I teach this at the company level I talk to the captains and, and company officers about if you're not influencing your members somebody is going to be and they are quick if you've been in the fire service for any time at all they're very quick to go with um, somebody somebody's going to influence them and you've seen firefighters do things they know they're not supposed to do because somebody else is doing it and so I'm going to show you a quick video and um, that, that kind of illustrates this and adds a little humor to it
The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality but little by little he looks at his watch but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall now we we'll try it once again here's the candid subject here comes the candid camera staff three of them at least and uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. <laughs> You're going to see a fellow who uh, fights a little bit to withstand the group pressure now. He'll express his discomfort in the way he looks and the way he uh, wiggles a little bit, but watch. He's right in the groove now. The elevator hasn't budged, but the doors open a moment later, and this we find He's very unhappy. You'll see him. He doesn't know whether to go inside and face front or outside and face back. But he's one of the group now. Here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll see if we can use now we'll see if we can use group pressure for some good now in a moment on Charlie's signal everybody turns forward notice, notice they take off their hats and now do you think we could reverse the procedure watch So as you can see, people are easily influenced, and as the battalion chief, um, your job is to continue to have the, the right kind of influence on your members, along with your company officers, um, in following the chain of command, we'll, and we'll talk about that in a, in a future section. So we move on to the original list of knowing your expectations, and I can't acknowledge and, and offer how important that this part of the promotion process at any level is. You should know before you get there. You should have a really good idea what those expectations are before you get there, just from obser observation, hopefully from observation, and from doing a little bit of research and, and asking some questions. Um, nothing should really be a surprise to you when you get to that job. I knew going into my particular situation what the job entailed, and there were a lot of different factors that went into me taking uh, the promotion because I really, really liked being a captain. And I, it, in my eyes, it's the best job on the, on the fire department. But you accept the promotion and, and don't be surprised and disgruntled and become the unhappy guy because it's not all the things you thought it was. I knew exactly going into it what it was. It was running some occasional fires. It was being in command. It was putting out the daily fires in the firehouses between personalities and 
differences and grievances and knowing the collective bargaining agreement and operating within it and doing the schedule and handling duty exchanges and floater vacation days and scheduled vacation days and sick time and work comp paperwork and all of the things that went with the position at our place of what battalion chief is. And I, I knew going in because I had worked in that capacity as an acting officer, um, talking to my battalion chief when I was a captain, um, and he expressed the same, I, won't, I don't want to say frustrations, but he missed being on the truck as well. So I knew going in what it was, so I had no business at all being upset or um or mad or frustrated with the situation with what it is because it is what it is. So, if you don't know what those expectations are, you need to ask whoever it is, the chief. If you have a deputy chief or division chief, you need to ask. Uh, just ask what what the what the expectations are of that position before you consider taking it, so that when you walk into there, you know what you're getting into. There's there's no surprises, and in in turn. When you start looking at company officers and you've got them on your crew and you've got those candidates that you know, you know, we've all got those guys that are strong candidates to promote up to company officer, it's important that you convey to your captains or lieutenants that they convey to their members the expectations that, that are required for the company officer level. It needs to go up and down the chain. With that, we need to understand the job description, and they're all different. They're all going to be unique. They're going to be different for each organization and the type of organization that you work in. And again, like we said earlier, the size. You need to know those job descriptions and accept that you're no longer a company officer, so don't act like one. And what I mean by that is don't overstep your responsibilities. You know, we all should be involved in training, but the load of the training falls on my captains. Am I still involved? Do I still play a role? I do, but not as heavy of one as I did when I was a captain. He's the guy developing his crew members. It doesn't do them a lot of good. Um, I'll interject, but I try real hard to stay out of it if I, if I can, because that's what the captains are there for. That's their job. And that's been one of the hardest transitions for me. Um, the other part of that is, you can't be running into every building. Um, I know a couple of battalion chiefs that they tank up and right away they're they're in. Um, you're, you're the command and control component in a lot of these incidents and the first one to do that and to set up your, your structure and make sure crew resource management is, is being handled correctly. And uh, you're doing your company officers a disservice by, you know, not taking on that responsibility. And it's tough for some of the hard charging uh, guys that love going inside and, and getting involved um, you, you need to kind of hold your ground. We'll talk about this in the command function a little bit. <clears throat> uh, the other part of that is um, you've got to be careful pulling members aside when uh, something's going on instead of not talking to the company officer about it. You really need to file. You expect your members, and I have this discussion frequently with my company officers and the members on the department, that I expect people to follow the chain of command. I don't want people going over my head to the chief. Uh, at the same time, I don't want my captain's members going over his head either. And I make a, a very specific and, um, you know, I, I'm very careful. When I call an outline engine house, I always ask for the captain. Um, and then I'll talk to a member after I've told him, as long as it's not personal, um, you know, or, or private. But I always go through the officer first. And a lot of times I'll relay the message to the officer and let him relay it to the member. And I expect the same coming back up. There's likely to be a significant change in roles. And that change in roles, uh, we've, we've kind of talked about how you train, how you deal with members, um, what your day-to-day -day responsibilities are. And you've got to be, you've got to trust your company officers to get things done that you used to get done and that you want to still try and do on your own. But what I have found is the more that I give up to my company officers, the more that I give to them to do that the things I want to do, the things that I like to do and that I enjoy doing, um, there, you can just see how there's that respect. For example, I saw a huge change in one captain in particular whenever anytime I call the house, I ask for him. Anytime I walk in that house, I ask for him. Um, it doesn't mean you ignore the people there, but you don't address things without talking to that captain first. 
And I could tell a big difference in how he responded to things and he felt respected and he felt um, like he was in charge and, and he was at that house. And his members offered the same respect because it was, it was I don't want to say demanded, but it's just the way I, I respected him. The members saw that and he did and they did the same thing uh, for, for them. So those roles change a little bit. You've got to be able to give up some. And then define your position, make it the place to be. So when I talked earlier about how um, the, 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 you have to know the expectations and you have to know the job, that doesn't mean you can't redefine that position in, in certain situations. And what I mean by that is if, if the other battalion chiefs just succumb to and they're, they've, they've given up and all I do is sit at the desk, well – they're probably not engaged as much as they should be. And, and you can be very engaged and still not be micromanaging your people. And for an example, and you, you may or may not be paramedics, but I'm the first paramedic battalion chief at my department. And one of the first things I did was I put medical equipment, advanced life support equipment on that car, Narcan, some IVs, some first-line cardiac drugs. Now, we still only have an AED, but the point was that um, I would run calls and it was kind of fun because I would be out and about and, and a call would come in and I would be close and it wouldn't matter what kind of call it was for EMS and I would show up and the ambulance crew would show up and look at me cross-eyed like, what are you doing here? But what I'm doing is I'm redefining that position that I'm not too good and I'm not promoted too high to still run the most basic of EMS calls. And in, in doing so, I get to maintain some skills. I get to do some patient evaluations. And I think it's good for the public to see that you know, a chief officer every so often uh, are on these calls. And I think it's also good for the crew to know, and it's it's not like you're checking up on them or you want them, you know, worried about how they act. But I think it's good that in the back of their mind, they know the chief could be there. And it's not because I'm checking up on them. It's because either one, I'm really bored. But most of the time, it's because I want to stay involved at that level. I'm not overstepping the boundaries. I don't take the patient care away from the ambulance. I do what they tell me to do in most instances, and uh, but I'm there. I'm, I'm present, and you can redefine a lot of things. You can get involved in a, in a lot of different things like that and redefine the position so it's not so monotonous or too administrative or whatever it might be. So here, here's where some we, we kind of get into that struggle is having a new perspective. And it, you have to see things a little bit different. And this kind of goes back to when I talked about the uh, being a former shift rep and people telling you you forgot where you came from. And I can remember sitting down um, right after I got promoted to battalion chief and I pulled the shop steward in. And uh, I just told him, I said, hey, you know, I'm going to see things differently. It's not It's not a personal thing. But my job and responsibilities require me to look at things in a little bit different light. I'm not backtracking, but you know my, my responsibilities lie in X, Y, Z. In the past, they lied in A, B, C. And you have to understand what those differences are. Sometimes your perspective is not different, but your responsibilities are. And you're going to have a different perspective on certain things. And most of the time, I'd say 98% of our problems when we run into this is administrative. Be prepared for finger pointing. You're going to get it. You're going to have people telling you you forgot where you came from and you're not the same guy you used to be and, and, and all those arguments. And especially if you're taking charge, especially if you're holding people accountable, especially if you have the ability to tell people no uh, when it's appropriate, which is very liberating if you don't do it. And, uh, I, I highly encourage that when it's appropriate, you tell people no uh, decisively. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the leadership module, but be prepared for the finger point. It's going to happen. People you thought you were friends with and, you know, when you walk into the room, um, they're, they're going to stop talking to you or they're going to stop the conversation. You're just not part of that group anymore. And that's not the case everywhere, but by and large, especially if you're going from the collective bargaining unit out of it, you're going to get some of that. Uh, you've got to be a parent of sorts. Um, what I've found is that managing my 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 shift is a lot like managing my kids and yes some of the problems are very juvenile just like they are at my house and 
it goes back to kind of like you got to treat everybody fair, but you won't treat them all the same. And there are, you'll be able to label and, and know this guy is always like this. This guy's always like that. You know, I've got, you know, a kid at home that's very outgoing and driven. I got another kid that's withdrawn and real lazy. You know, I got another kid that loves to, you know, be out in the public and be in the spotlight and is very social. And another one is more withdrawn. And so you're going to have the same thing with your crew and you've got to figure those things out. You've got to look at other people's perspective too, especially uh, you, you, when you were a captain or a company officer, you did things a certain way. You had um, methods to your madness, so to speak. You did things with purpose um, the way you wanted to do them. And as a battalion chief, you've got to let them run. You've got to let them roll and do their own thing. And to stand back and watch sometimes them do it not the way you did it can be very, very difficult at times. But just because it's different doesn't mean it's wrong. And we have to have enough perspective to have, it's kind of where these expectations come in. And, and we did some organizational um, objectives and goals last week. This week, we're going to do some personal ones. And you'll see where you can kind of set up your your guide on how things get done. It may not get done exactly how you want it, but we want to accomplish the mission. But it's difficult, very, very difficult to sit back and watch others do it differently than you did, especially if what you did worked well, especially if you were really successful with how you did things. It's a challenge to sit back and watch others do it differently. And sometimes they struggle, but sometimes we have to let them fail and let them struggle to learn on their own. Yeah, we can offer some guidance. Yes, we can offer some suggestions and, and advice. But a lot of times, you know, gee, as long as it's not on the fire ground and it's not a safety issue, it's good for those guys and gals, whoever those company officers are, to fail and learn from that on their own. So keep that perspective and don't box yourself in. Adapt when you need to adapt. And what that means is you got to be flexible and you have to be open-minded enough that when somebody's got an idea that's different than yours doesn't mean it's not going to work. So I'm going to play you another video that talks about perspective. Okay, it, it, it deals with looking at things from a different view and this because it's different doesn't make it wrong. Imagine you're standing on a street anywhere in America, and a Japanese man comes up to you and says, uh, excuse me, what is the name of this block? And you say, I'm sorry, well, this is Oak Street, that's Elm Street, this is 26th, that's 27th. He says, okay, but what is the name of that block? And you say, well, blocks don't have names. Streets have names. Blocks are just the unnamed spaces in between streets. He leaves a little confused and disappointed. So now imagine you're standing on a street anywhere in Japan. You turn to a person next to you and say, excuse me, uh, what is the name of this street? And they say, oh, well, that's block 17, and this is block 16. And you say, OK, but what is the name of this street? And they say, well, streets don't have names. Blocks have names. Just look at Google Maps here. There's block 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. All of these blocks have names, and the streets are just the unnamed spaces in between the blocks. And you say, okay, then how do you know your home address? I said, well, easy, this is District 8, there's Block 17, House Number 1. They say, okay, but walking around the neighborhood, I noticed that the house numbers don't go in order. I said, of course they do, they go in the order in which they were built. The first house ever built on a block is House Number 1, the second house ever built is House Number 2, third is House Number 3, it's easy, it's obvious. So. I love that sometimes we need to go to the opposite side of the world to realize assumptions we didn't even know we had and realize that the opposite of them may also be true. So for example, there are doctors in China who believe that it's their job to keep you healthy. So any month you are healthy, you pay them. And when you're sick, you don't have to pay them because they failed at their job. They get rich when you're healthy, not sick. In, <laughs> in most music, we think of the one as the downbeat, the beginning of the musical phrase. One, two, three, four. But in West African music, the one is thought of as the end of the phrase, like the period at the end of a sentence. So you can hear it not just in the phrasing, but the way they count off their music, two, three, four, one. And this map is also accurate. 
there's a saying that whatever true thing you can say about india, the opposite is also true. so let's never forget, whether at ted or anywhere else, that whatever brilliant ideas you have or hear, that the opposite may also be true. domo arigatou gozaimashita. Okay, so a little video there with uh, perspective and some interesting information, but it, it paints a, a good picture on what perspective means and thinking a little bit differently. So we're going to move into this next slide, and we've discussed it a little bit, is um, the, the labor to staff. And this is one that, if you have this situation, can be a struggle. And... Uh, I remember the challenge of asking for my withdrawal card. It's it's a, you know you you get your withdrawal card, which is uh, you've left in good standing with the union after so many years, almost 20 years uh, of being in the uh, International Association of Firefighters and and serving as a shift rep and going some going through some really tough times at our department. You know, 10 years ago or so, um, as a as a union sh representative for our people uh, and having some really big fights and, and drop down with our uh, political subdivision and you create um, a reputation and some credibility through that but it can be difficult as you advance up as an officer um, because as soon as you hold somebody accountable uh, you're no longer a brother um, but but just remember this just because you're not in the collective bargaining union you're not paying dues anymore you're you've got your withdrawal card however your situation works. The brotherhood's not gone. Um, it, it is what you make it. It, it. You have to maintain those relationships. And for an example, uh, you know, I try to find opportunities to do things uh, with the guys, some of the guys on my time off. I, I avoid doing a lot um, on the time off with people that I'm close to at work just because of the dynamic that it creates and some of the challenges it creates. And we'll talk about that in a later module. But uh, we're doing a 13-mile trail run next Sunday, uh, which this you, you won't know what that is, but coming up, we're doing a trail run. <clears throat> and it's a good time to get together and do something with your crew um, that's both beneficial and, and, and kind of organic, I guess. Uh, but the brotherhood's not gone. Even at work, it's not gone. And the important thing is this, that when you are dealing with friends and people that you served side by side with and had some of the same discussions and frustrations and challenges that you may be part of now uh, just from operating in the system that's in place uh, you've, you've got to be careful with with how you adjust and adapt to that but don't don't get too down don't get too depressed um, the brotherhood's still there it's still there for you um, you just have to kind of let it be really don't don't isolate yourself just because you're no longer a union member. Uh, it can be a difficult transition for some. And again, the biggest problem comes from the friendships that are developed over time. And um, if some severe disciplinary actions come up that you're a part of or have to be uh, where the buck stops and, and you make those decisions, it's going to affect some of those relationships. And it's going to affect some of the way that you're viewed uh, by others especially as one that if it's if you're recently if you've recently come off the floor uh, it can be a real challenge but you can't let that sway you and you can't let they're going to use that against you they're going to want to say you know I well when you were in the union you did this when you were a shift rep you did this or when you were a shop steward you did this and most of the time you have to own up that yeah I did uh, but you're you're like we said before your perspective is different now and your responsibilities are different your loyalties change um, who gives you your authority and that's really what this boils down to is that when you become a battalion chief even as a company officer your loyalties we're always loyal to our men all right we're always loyal to the members but you've got to be loyal to the people that give you authority and those people are the chief uh, your division chiefs and that's that's where your authority comes from that's who gives you the ability to do your job that's who pays your paycheck that's who sets you with the expectations. Um, I mean, the trumpets are given to you as an extension of the fire chief. You're the chief when he's not there. And so you have to operate in, in a manner that he would. So 
that's not always easy, especially when you don't agree with it a hundred percent, but that's who your loyalty lies with. Not that the members don't give you the membership unless, unless you're a voted in volunteer. In that case, you've got a very fine line. And I can tell you as a former fire chief of a fully volunteer department, I didn't play that game. Well, um, the, the members vote you in for a number of reasons. Some don't like it when you hold them to be accountable. And so I didn't last very long as a volunteer fire chief because um, it wasn't a priority of mine to make the members happy that voted for me. It was a priority to run a fire department the way you run a fire department. So there are challenges in that realm. But you do have to understand that you're an extension of the fire chief. That's who you're really loyal to. That's, that's who gives you your authority by, you know, probably by policy, um, when you take your oath, whatever it might be. And so don't confuse that. And then communicate with your labor leaders and build a relationship. And like I said, the first thing I did when I got promoted, I pulled the shop steward in, had a very open and frank conversation that things that we negotiated together as shift reps and as a union executive board, I might see differently now due to my responsibility as a battalion chief. From a personal standpoint, I may still agree with it, but from a management standpoint, I may see it differently um, because my chief requires me to and because the way we operate, because of what the policies say. And not to take it personally and to expect to, to have some differences of opinion um, and, and to have that open line of communication. I probably talk to my shift rep at least once a day, just about regular flow of information, You know, just about what's going on, challenges, uh, problems. Uh, things that are going well, um, you know, so so I have a strong relationship with the shift rep. And then finally, follow the rules. Um, it's real easy to want to vary from rules and from um, things that are in a contract because of who's involved or because it seems insignificant. But as soon as you start doing that, even for the littlest things, you're you're going down a pretty slippery slope. And you've got to be very careful of that. And, and I can tell you, you know, we, we've got a rule, and it sound it may sound ridiculous to you, but it's, there's a reason it's there. Is when you're on extended sick leave or work comp, you have to call in every Monday between 8 and 4 and tell us when next time you're going to the doctor, a progress report. And it's just to stay in touch with the fire district that we don't, you know, I, before we had that rule, we had a guy that was out for six months and you never heard from him for six months. The work comp people would fax his paperwork and that was it. But we want to know kind of what's going on, be able to ask questions and just stay in contact. And, you know, I've had to give people verbal warnings and one guy has gotten a written reprimand because he doesn't call it on Monday. But once you let one small rule like that, you know, go, what happens when the, so one day he doesn't call in, well, the next guy doesn't call in for three days. Where do you draw that line? So you just an example that, You've got to hold people accountable. You, it's not easy to, to to do it, especially if you're coming into an office that it was never done, where nobody was held accountable. And now all of a sudden you're going to come in with values and and uh, integrity and you're going to hold people accountable. And it's not going to go over real well, but you've got to stick to your guns. So don't take it personally. And this is going to go pretty quick. But keep your emotions in check. And I struggle with this. We all struggle with this. When people challenge you, they're going to do things that are going to put you in a bad situation. They're going to say things about you, and it's real easy to get angry. And uh, you've got to try and um, keep those emotions in check to the point to where I may not discipline somebody until I know that I can do it without um, having emotions involved. Um, I'll qu- I'll quit um participating in a, in a conversation or debate um, if I know that my emotions are going to play a role in what I say. And it takes some practice and it takes some recognition and some patience to do that. But uh, as the person that's in charge and, and you're, the buck stops here, uh, you got to keep those emotions in check at all time. Socializing, and there's different opinions on this. I limit my socializing with the members of my crew. Um, I don't not do it, but I'm not out every weekend um, with the people on my shift. And I've got my own reasons for that. It was advice that I'd gotten from a very successful and wise 
fire officer many, many years ago, and it, it's, it's worked for me. It doesn't mean you can't do it. And other people have argued with me about this, and you can take it for what it's worth. Just understand that it can be difficult, especially uh, where you've got the Guinness going, uh, to, uh, you've got to be very careful because people, you don't know what they're, what they're going to say, what you're going to say. Uh, the last thing you want to do is have a conversation in a public social setting that something accidentally slips. Um, and you also, you know, you build those friendships and it does get tougher when you have to discipline them. I don't care what anybody says. I've seen it. I've had people tell me up and down, oh, it won't be a problem. It won't be a problem. But I'm here to tell you who's had to deal with it more than one time. It is a problem. It is more difficult. It does create problems in the firehouse. It does create tension. And uh, we'll talk more about that in later. But just understand, have your own policy on how you socialize, how you keep those things in check. Just be aware. I'm not here to tell you how to do it, not to do it. Just know that as a battalion chief, when you're socializing with the members on a regular basis and you create those relationships, we're fantastic. All right. They're, they're great. They're great things. Just be cognizant and aware of how you're going to deal with that and, and the conversations you're willing to have and not have when you're in a social environment. You have to put aside friendships and that goes with the socializing up, up, up above it. Um, and not easy thing to do. And people will say, well, I, we, don't, we don't have to put aside friendships. They just shouldn't put me in that position. Well, that's real easy to say. It just doesn't always work that way. And um, I, 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 from personal experiences, I've had this problem uh, where friends, they don't do it on purpose. Um, you have to discipline them. And you have to hold them accountable. And it's not an easy thing to do. But don't, don't let that friendship prevent you from having those conversations because people will notice uh, that it's going to be harder to keep order on your shift or in your battalion whenever you don't address the same issues with your friend that you do with others or you don't do it in a timely manner. It's real easy to put off having to have that difficult conversation with a friend as opposed to somebody you're not emotionally tied to. You'll have personal feelings, just don't act on them, whether it's positive or negative. Whatever those personal feelings are, um, maybe the person you like the least um, is is in a situation and you've got to ask, are you treating him fairly? Are you treating him uh, with the same you know, judicial temperament and uh, methods that you would with your best friend? If the answer is no, you've got a problem. And then finally, it can change relationships. Don't be surprised when people that you thought you were friends now don't really talk to you. They give you a cold shoulder after certain things. You might not, We had a disciplinary situation in our department last summer with a, with a member uh, who was popular and was a good friend of mine. And after that, people that I thought were my friends, they weren't even, a, they weren't even the ones that got in trouble uh, still give me a cold shoulder because they didn't like the way we handled it. And you know what? You have to just move past it. You have to move on. And, uh, and take it for what it's worth. But you can't let it, um, you can't let it affect how you run the, run the crew. And I know the saying, well, if they were your friend, they wouldn't do it to begin with. Um, and, and I get all that. But it is something you're going to have to deal with uh, that's uncomfortable. And it's a little disappointing. And um, it can affect, you know, your relationships. And you have to expect that. So... <clears throat> We talked about you know expectations and um, rules have to be followed. You rules are not necessarily just in the policies and procedures and SOGs. There are some rules that you're going to have to come up with that fall in line with the mission and intent of the organization, and that's why it's important that we have those objectives and goals um, for your crew and your shift. Uh, you know, for me, one of them is that. Um, Anytime they go, my, my crews go on a, a medical call or a call where the driver really isn't needed. Um, it's not, a, not an incident where all the members are needed. My drivers, and I started this when I was a captain, was that the drivers all take in a little bag and they check every smoke detector and CO detector in the house. And it's not always popular because some drivers don't like to get out of the behind the wheel. 
But that's a rule that an expectation that goes along with our mission and goals and objectives that um, it killed a couple birds with one stone. And what's interesting now is in the fire reports, I will see where the captains report um, on an EMS call that six smoke detector batteries were changed or we installed three smoke detectors in a house that had none. So it's making a difference, um, but it's something that it had two purposes um, that I won't get into right now, but it, it solved those problems for us. You need to rein in anything that is loose and detrimental. You need to find out what is kind of, what's a poison on your shift? What What's something that maybe it's a person, maybe it's the way they do some things. Um, is there a policy or guideline that's not been followed um, as tightly as it should be? Um, you'll know when you get there, probably before you get there, some areas that need to be tightened up and you need to do that pretty quick. Um, when you sit down and talk about the expectations with uh, your, your captains, you're going to know pretty quick what that is. And I'll tell you one for me was, um, the, the crew that I went to had a guy that, um, has been disgruntled. He doesn't violate the contract, but he would never come in to the engine house unless he had to. So if his crew showed up to pick up some, 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 some supplies, there wasn't a formal training going on. He just hit the truck. He wouldn't, he would not, um, be part of the crew. And I had to sit with his captain and say, listen, when the crew is doing something, the crew has to be doing it, which means including him. And, and two years later, um, he, he's better. He's not, not great, but he's better. Um, another thing for me was that um, in, my, in my houses, nobody's allowed to be in flip-flops or sweatpants um, and shirts need to be tucked in. Basically, if you are in a position that you could answer the door um, or the public can see you, you've got to be in uniform. Now, if you're walking to the kitchen after working out to get a glass of water, there's some exceptions. But I had people coming down at 9 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday in flip-flops, gym shorts, and a T-shirt untucked and sitting down eating breakfast, and that's just not acceptable to me. At any time, the public can come to those doors and – and see us. And I want them to, I don't want them thinking we're lounging, that we're, you know, too relaxed. Uh, and, and I, it's just not acceptable. So those are some things that I reined in. I know they sound like simple things, but it does set a tone, uh, for the crew and it wasn't always popular. All right. Set these expectations and you got to have follow through. If you're going to set an expectation and you should have a list um, some of them are going to be just reiterations of what people already know. Some of them are going to be unique to you. Um, and you've got to have follow through though. You know, the, the morning that one of my guys, when I first came to his shift as a battalion chief walked down on that Saturday morning and I turned around and I said, Hey, you know, where's your clothes? What's well, Saturday morning chief? And I said, are you able to answer the door right now? Somebody knocks on it. Yeah, I'll go change. And they, they get it, you know, but you've got to have that follow through. If I would have let it go because it was Saturday and because he's a friend of mine, um, you know, it, it blows the whole thing out of the water. And when I see guys that don't have their shirts tucked in, I tell them, and I know it sounds like a small thing, but it's those little things that, um, you know, you, you only get one time for a first impression and you set the tone with the little things and it makes the big things a little easier to address. And don't micromanage it's their crew. And we talked a little bit about this. Don't, you got to delegate, you got to let them run. And when you do that, let them do it. Um, it doesn't mean you can't provide some help. You can't ask about progress. You can't question the captain privately about what he's doing or how he's doing it. Uh, but you got to let your, I can tell you as a, when I was a captain, I had a great battalion chief and he never, he, he never overstepped that line. On occasion, he would ask why I was doing certain things, but just because you did it one way doesn't mean that's the way it needs to be done. As long as they're accomplishing what needs to be accomplished in the, in a timely manner and it's safe and, and all the things, the expectations and boundaries that you put out there, let them do it. It doesn't matter if they did it the way you did it or not. And that is one of the biggest obstacles that I've seen as a captain and as a battalion chief that people struggle with. So, Week two assignments. So I want you to create an action plan to overcome three challenges. 
that you have identified in making the transition for the floor to the desk. Uh, this should include a description of each challenge and how they will impede progress of the transition. The plan should also include measurable goals and actions that address each challenge. So you'll notice with these assignments, I want you to be as specific as possible. And it's going to take time. It takes a little bit of work. I understand that. But it is a battalion chief's class that hopefully when you're done with this class, you've got a lot of documents, a lot of material to reflect on, review, and uh, use as reference material as you go through your career. Also, use it to mentor uh, future battalion chiefs, your company officers, and implement these things in your department. Um, in the same way, you develop the mission, goals, and objectives for the organization. Do the same for you in this position. Feel free to adapt your action plan into your mission, core values, goals, and objectives. Your objectives should be specific and answer how, when, and where. When you list an objective, um, let's just say that I want to read more officer books or leadership books. All right, so that's a pretty broad and general objective. And it should be, I'm going to read four, you know, books, you know, by June, whatever, or by the end of the year, I'm going to read these four books. <clears throat> so these are the discussion questions that you're going to put on the course site's website for the discussion forum. And the first one is, what are three challenges to the battalion chief position that are unique to your organization, and how do you plan to overcome them? Remember, what's unique to your organization, because we want to have discussion about and share things that people can help you with specifically. And then share your biggest concerns with making the transition, or if you have already done so, what were the biggest concerns regarding your relationships? So... Share those with the group. Hopefully, you'll get some good feedback from each other. Um, I, I monitor it. I don't normally comment in the discussion forum. Um, so, and I, I may not comment on all of your documents either, as you might have seen from week one. And when also, when all of these documents come in at the same time, it takes me a little longer to get to. So, be patient if it takes two or three days for me to get to your, your um, assignments. So, that's week two. I appreciate all of the um, effort and time you've put into week one. I hope you do the same for week two. And have a great week, and we will see you next week for week three.